Funding for Frontline is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight on Frontline, inside one of America's toughest prisons. Any officer who walks in here and says he's not afraid, he's a liar. The penitentiary of New Mexico, a maximum security prison filled with violence, fear, and gangs who make their own rules. The most action is in the areas of gambling, the, the extortion, the prostitution. Has prison reform gone too far? We might as well give the keys to the inmates. They're running it anyway. Tonight, Shakedown in Santa Fe. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Tonight on Frontline, a portrait of a power struggle, the struggle for control of America's prisons. In the 1970s, after decades of experimentation with rehabilitation programs, Americans began to demand that we use our prisons to punish offenders and to protect the public. But hand in hand with this new toughness came a flood of court challenges by prisoners, charges of inhumane conditions, from overcrowding to inmate abuse. As a result, today, 36 of our state prison systems are actually run by rules handed down by the federal courts. Tonight, we will go inside one of America's toughest prisons, the penitentiary of New Mexico, to examine the struggle for control between the jailers and the jailed. Our program is called Shakedown in Santa Fe. It was produced by Hector Galan. This is the penitentiary of New Mexico. This maximum security prison near Santa Fe holds almost 800 inmates. It has a tough and violent reputation. We got a May Day here in 82. We got a May Day. Repeat May Day. On February 2nd, 1980, this prison exploded into one of the bloodiest riots in U.S. history. The inmates' anger and frustration, fueled by years of overcrowding and poor living conditions, finally boiled over early one Saturday morning. Convicts suddenly overpowered guards, took 12 hostage, and within minutes, over 1,000 prisoners seized complete control of the prison. The administration running this place here in the institution is abusive towards the people. They have no respect. There's a lack of communication with the inmates. During the riot's early hours, convicts negotiated with officials using two-way radios taken from the guards. No hostages have been armed, and it'll stay that way as long as you people don't make any drastic moves. We expect to be treated right. There's food that is very poor. There's medication that is not given when it's needed. You've got no privacy. You cannot sit and write your own letters. You cannot sit down and uh, uh, think for yourself and try and get your act, your act, act together. In the area, let's go, move! As negotiations continued, the rioters released the guard hostages one by one. Many of the guards had been brutally beaten, stabbed, and raped. As the riot continued, the released hostages and escaping prisoners began to tell stories of atrocities taking place inside the prison, of convicts slaughtering other inmates. 
negotiations continued into a second day. We will get the hostages out here and... The rioters demanded better living conditions. As officials met their terms, the convicts released their last hostage. None of the hostages were killed. The rioters held the prison for 36 hours. Let's go! Let's go, move it. On Sunday afternoon, New Mexico State Police SWAT teams, prison guards, and the National Guard retook the penitentiary without firing a shot. Inside, they discovered tortured, mutilated bodies scattered throughout the prison. 33 inmates lay dead. 200 other prisoners had been beaten and raped. A hundred were seriously injured. The prison was almost totally destroyed by fire and water. Estimated damages, over $20 million. Hundreds of reporters and television crews were finally allowed inside the walls. Their reports brought the brutality of the riot to public view. I think that everyone who was connected with that prison at the time of the riot prior to that should be transferred to another governmental job. Did you hear how it Citizen groups demanded answers from New Mexico's governor and the Department of Corrections and immediate reform of the conditions that led to the riot. Advocates of prison reform who had seen firsthand the inhumane conditions in the prison came forward, including attorney Mark Donatelli. The overcrowding, uh, the brutality inflicted on inmates uh, by staff members, uh, the substandard conditions that existed for at least a decade, uh, the inadequate security system that was in place, substandard food, lack of opportunity for activity, the absence of an incentive-based uh, activity program. Uh, those conditions were in effect uh, for at least 10 years prior to the riot. This attorney general's report on the riot also criticized the prison's widespread use of a snitch system. The prison administration encouraged inmates to inform on each other to get better treatment. It was well known uh, what abuse of the snitch system had been made at that time and what kinds of inmate tension uh, that causes, uh, the types of, of vengeance that people were likely to witness if inmates had the opportunity to take matters into their own hands. So I think it was easily predictable that certain informants, certain inmates, uh, would be killed. I don't think anyone would have predicted that they would be killed in the, the fashion that they were or that as many of them would have been killed as, as were. Two weeks after the riot, the New Mexico legislature appropriated almost 40 million dollars to fix its long ignored prison system. And the federal courts ordered sweeping reforms to bring the prison up to national standards. Today, eight years after the riot, those court-ordered reforms are still closely monitored by the federal government to ensure that inmates' constitutional rights will never again be violated. The court orders include 624 rules that dictate almost every aspect of prison life. Rules for staffing and training. Rules for acceptable disciplinary procedures. Rules for how the security system should operate. To avoid overcrowding, the federal court limits the inmate population. Today, officials encourage more work and recreation to eliminate inmate idleness, a problem before the riot. Prisoners can now choose from more community and educational programs and facilities were improved to make the prison more livable. But after all these reforms, the penitentiary of New Mexico is still haunted by the 1980 riot.
William Jack Stevens, serving a life sentence for killing another inmate in 1978, participated in the riot. You guys didn't fulfill your bargain. Nobody During the final hours of the riot, Stevens became one of the inmate negotiators. He says he saw many of the inmate killings. Once they started killing, then, you know, I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse. And, and uh, finally, there wasn't enough people to kill, so they would have to do real crazy shit to the ones that they were killing. Many of the murdered inmates lived here in protective custody, or PC, the cell block for weaker inmates and for those hated by the majority of prisoners, the sex offenders and informants, or snitches. The killing started down here on this end of the tier, and uh, the guys that lived down on this end of the tier had to wait their turn, you know, and, you know, I've often thought about that because, you know, I've thought, yeah, well, I wonder what these guys were, what was going through these guys' mind when they, you know, they know that sale by sale, you know, pretty soon it's going to be their turn. Some of the sale doors wouldn't open and, and uh, they were taking cutting torches and, and cutting the doors off and, and these guys would be in the sale behind mattresses while their doors were being cut off and uh, while this was going down, you know, guys would be out in front of the house telling them shit like, uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, you know, a few more minutes, motherfucker, and we're gonna be in there, and then, it, you know, and then we're killing your ass, and uh, talking real bad to them and telling them, you know, what's gonna happen to them as soon as the door's gone and they can get inside that cell with them, this is what's gonna happen to you. guys that were killed or stabbed or, or whatever happened to them up on top in their house would be dragged out and tossed over the tier and they would crash like uh, three floors down into the concrete and there were people down there with knives that when the guy when you know when they hit the ground then would go you know and finish them off. I saw a lot of bodies being brought out. Uh, some were being rolled out uh, with, the, with the arms or whatever, you know, following them, you know. They throw pieces out. Marcela Armijo, one of the first women guards in a men's maximum security prison, was off duty the night the riot began. With the inmate families and other off-duty guards, she waited outside the prison during the siege. At that time, the governor didn't even want us to come in, but I was, I was wishing that he would let us come in because all the commotion would die down one way or another, no matter what, ha what it took to, to take the, the penitentiary over again, that's what it was going to take. And I, and I wish to God he would have he let us come in. I don't think that so many killings would have happened. In the eight years since the riot, Stevens has become powerful and influential among his fellow inmates. Prison officials say he is a major convict leader. Going to, to, uh, After 12 years on the line, Marcella is now Captain Armijo. She is shift commander in charge of security for the entire prison. I don't take any crap from anybody. I don't take shit from anybody. Every day, Marcella inspects the cell blocks. You're 1098, cell block 4, 1021 extension, 777. Get all the shit off the walls. Get them off. She looks for contraband, weapons, drugs, and money. And she watches for suspicious behavior. Get up and make your bed. Okay. Yes, mama, this. What do you say? Yes, mama. Get off again. You never really know an inmate. You could only trust him and know him to a certain point. You can't take one to your house. I wouldn't. You know, uh, 
I like a lot of the inmates that are here, a lot of the old timers, they know exactly where I stand and, and how far they can get with me. Um, but I would never go as far as saying I trust one. You've been calling her? Yeah. I'll see. I'll talk to the male people. All I can do is give it to, I'll give it to Virgil. Because of her power, inmates often bring their problems to Marcella. She acts as a liaison between the prisoners and the administration. You no, know, that's the way I received it. It's a, it's a canvas, but when I finish with it, all of it will be covered. Where are you going to put it? What do you mean in here? Uh-huh. Are you going to send it home? I'll send it out, but first I'm going to get a frame put on it. And I'm, I'm not here to judge an inmate in his crime. I'm just here to do the job, and I'm, you know, I won't go and read uh, why an inmate killed his wife or why, you know, or how he killed her, you know. Um, I won't do that. They're all the same to me. It's all a game, you know. And you know, you watch them, and they watch you. And the longer you're here, the more you know. How's it going? Did you get an old timer here that's been here? eight, nine, ten years, twelve years, like myself, and uh, we know the inmate. I know the inmate. Come on, Nolan. Come on, Nolan. Yeah. Playing games, that's what it's all about. See how far they can get away with stuff. Uh, beating the system. No, go ahead. No, no. After 18 years behind bars, Stevens is an expert at playing the game. I know that I do wrong every day, and it's her job to bust me if she can. So, you know, I have to keep the relationship on, on the scale to where uh, we both understand that, uh, you know, I'm supposedly the bad guy, and she's got to try to bust me if she can. Now 38, Stevens sees himself as a professional convict. His friends call him Tupac for the cigarettes he uses as gambling chips. He says he lives by the convict code, the prisoner's unwritten rules for life behind bars. If I got to be in this pen and do time with all these people, I'm not gonna let nobody walk on me. I would rather be the way I am than be the way they wanted me. That's the difference between a convict and an inmate. There's certain things that I don't allow people to do to me, and, and there's things that I don't do to anyone, you know. And, and if you, you know, if you, if you go across those lines, then uh, you got to deal with it. If you're all right, you're regular, on the line, then you got my respect. If you got regs on the line, they all recognize that in each other, that same quality, you know. You don't fucking rat, you don't PC up, I don't rape women, and I don't fuck kids. But nowadays, there's so many sleazy motherfuckers that, that live on the other side of those lines that it's real hard to find guys that uh, have a moral standard that they live by when they're locked in. You know, we have tough enough getting past the, the guards, getting around them with the things that, that we're into. Once you find out there's somebody in, in here or anywhere on the line that's ratting, then that person has to go. You know, it's bad enough moving without the police being up on what's happening, you know, and, and uh, when you have, uh, you know, when you have people that, that tell them everything, and, uh, you know, those people have to go or be eliminated. When 
you live in, in a pen, you know, there's everything in here basically that there is in a small town or any kind of city on uh, out there, you know. You pay bills on the street, I pay bills in here. There's no difference other than we're confined and, and there's no broads, <laughs> you know, but all the, all the rest, I mean, it's a small society that you have to live by and, and there's rules and shit. You know. Two, six, five, three, nine. <laughs> Give me ten dollars worth there. You know, it costs. You know, if you want to have, uh, you know, I mean, I have a, a laundry man that 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 cleans all my clothes and shit every week. I have a guy that that works in the, in the chow hall that that makes special chow for me. But all this, all this thing is just like on the street. You know, I mean, you got to pay to have uh, extra shit. You know, it costs me maybe. A hundred a month to live good. It's kind of heavy. Uh, <laughs> I gamble a little bit, and uh, I have a pay number. You know, I get paid for uh, the job that I do every day, and, and uh, so there's, uh, you know, I have the money, so, you know, I, I pay guys to do shit. Uh, this is my uh, dollar a day Wait. that I earn <laughs> yeah, on my yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dollar a day, yeah. Yeah, but a day. Yeah, give me four, man. I like to eat good, you know, and I, I like, uh, you know, I like to be able to uh, walk up and down the hallway, dress real nice. She's taking her cash money right there, so, you know, man. I live, you know, as best I can under these conditions. What's in the in the vent? Nothing? Razor? For most inmates and the guards, prison life is dangerous. Marcella spends much of her time searching for handmade weapons called shanks. The reason that they uh, they they make the shanks is uh, protection and killing other inmates. This one is really cruddy. Uh, they try to to uh, to flatten it at the at the tip. It'll work, I guess. It'll work. You know, I'd hate to have this. It's really rusted. Uh, it's it's a pretty old shank. But I guess if they don't have anything else, they're, they're going to use it. Since the 1980 riot, prisoners have attacked more than 60 guards. Two were killed. I hate to see an officer or any staff member being carried out because of an inmate uh, attacks him or attacks her. And that's happened. And that's what, about one of the worst things you can see is seeing one of your own being carried out. It can, it can happen. I could be walking down the corridor and somebody, you know, could be ordered to, to make a hit on me or, or any officer. And we don't know if we're gonna, we don't know if we're gonna make it. Ignacio Marujo is Marcella's lieutenant. He enforces the captain's orders. Eight hours a day, you're a part of the prison. Anything's liable to happen to you. Any officer who walks in here and says he's not afraid is a liar. I've been here seven years, and I'm still, every time I walk in there, I still have that fear that I'm going to die today. But I've got to face that fear every day, and I've got to say, well, if it happens, I just hope it doesn't hurt too much. You're so good looking. The inmates, no matter how friendly you become with them, they'll burn you, one way or another. You never know when these inmates are gonna go off, and you play it strictly by ear. There are times that the inmates um, give you some kind of a, a sign, uh, body language. If you've been here for a while, you learn to, be, you learn to read body language. Mr. Collazo, you okay? Usually, um, the only time in this institution that an officer is 
hurt or killed is because the officer made a mistake or he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that comes from trusting an inmate too much or uh, becoming too friendly with the inmates. Stick with them. Uh, they need all the good men they can get. Yeah, well, they'll, they're gonna, it's going to get better for you. So stick with them. Warden George calm. Sullivan has worked in prisons for 32 years. Before coming to Santa Fe, he ran the maximum security prison in Oregon. He is New Mexico's fourth warden since the riot. I normally try to rate a prison in terms of the quality of life for inmates. And uh, in that respect, I, I rate this prison in the lower 10% of the nation. Any inmate coming into this prison is today very subject to being homosexually raped, uh, to being stabbed or perhaps killed by being stabbed to death, having his head bludgeoned. Minimally, he's subject to extortion to pay for his own safety. And frequently that extortion takes the form of requiring him to have his family members smuggle drugs into him to the institution, which he then must deliver on over to the people who are extorting from him. That condition is clearly present on a day-to-day -day basis within this prison. Take everything out of your pocket. Warden Sullivan says one of the biggest problems is the widespread drug use inside the prison. Take off your hat. Officials claim that all kinds of drugs, including heroin, can be bought at will, and their quality is often better than street drugs. You're all stoned, man. Go to your room. Go to shop. Any illicit drugs in a prison is way too many. Drug flow in this prison is considerably heavier than can be tolerated. Mr. Cruz, um, we're going to shake down some uh, cells, Moya, Peña, Busby, and Serrano. What I want you to do is hit the grills as soon as we walk in so that, uh, they don't have time to flush it down the toilet. Okay? We're on our way down. Hit those cells right away. Why don't you come over here, Serrano? Salas? Come on down. Come on down. Shake him down, my boy. Keep against him. To stem the drug flow, Marcella orders surprise shakedowns of cells and prisoners every day. Okay, go ahead and stay right there where you're at. Kenya, I'm serious. Kenya, mind your own business, man. Mind your business. Yeah, didn't he has something, man? You have something? Get in yourself. Get in yourself. Lock this place down right now. Get in yourself. Get in yourself. Get in yourself. Oh! Go! 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 Drugs in a prison are, are a horrible situation. The flow of drugs into this prison can be and eventually must be stopped. Where does he live? Open 49! 49! 49! They're done his house. Okay. They're, they're done. Step inside your cell, sir. In your house right now. Let's go. What do you want me to do? Bust the door? Open 35 and 36! This inmate did have a visit yesterday. They acted very suspicious. Most of the visitors that are come in or coming in, bringing in any type of contraband, usually are uh, very upset, very nervous, uh, sweating. They're acting very suspicious. 
we'll have to open it up a little bit. Why don't you yeah. give, give me your knife so we can... Well, let's wait till we go to investigations and we can test it right away. As as this looks open. like one. Yeah. Normally, it's stuck into the vagina. They go to the bathroom, withdraw it, put it in their mouths, kiss the uh, inmate they're going to give it to. The inmate swallows it, goes to his unit, regurgitates it up, and he's got his marijuana or his uh, money or whatever they were bringing in. Well, he's a good supplier, no? In this shakedown, guards found marijuana, codeine, and money, all wrapped tightly in balloons. Just tear it apart, okay? Check inside the socks, everything else, okay? The pockets. He's pretty stupid to have it out like that. But prison administrators say it's not just visitors who smuggle drugs into the prison. They believe that corrupt prison employees bring in most of the drugs. Drugs contribute greatly to the unacceptable quality of life for inmates. It's a power, it's a resource, it's a, um, a method of power for the inmate gang who controls the drugs. Gangs are a menacing hidden force inside the prison. They deal in fear and violence and wield great power over the inmates. Two, one, four, five, you nine, take off shirt for me? No. Guards identify gang members by their distinctive tattoos. The Chicanos, the prison's largest ethnic group, run the most powerful gangs. No tattoos, no other tattoos in that? Okay. You're pretty new, no? Yeah. Guess you're just hanging around with the wrong crowd in there. No? We have to realize that a gang of inmates in a prison have objectives for existence. To control drug traffic, to disrupt the administration of the prison, or to otherwise control the rackets within the prison. Well, I've been since a long time ago, Marcella. You know, I just got here from Central and stuff. I knew nobody. I've been threatened by these gang members. I've been told I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. <clears throat> this one here, they stated that he was, was, uh, was uh, the kingpin, okay? Him, I want All I'm doing is my job. He, he, I want him to go and to you know, if I wasn't doing my job, then I wouldn't be getting these threats. I wouldn't be getting threatened that you know, uh, they're gonna kill me or my family, my little girl, you know? It's happened. You're gonna move out? All right, we're gonna move out. Mm -hmm. But why are we getting kicked around all the time? You're not getting kicked around. You haven't been moved around. Huh? You hadn't been moved around. Now I'm getting moved. You're going to get moved. Yeah. To control gang activity, Marcella separates suspected me. gang members, moving them to different cells. These bullies, they threaten other inmates. Uh, they force other inmates to move out. They uh, bulldog for drugs coming in. Uh, you know, they bulldog the, the weaker inmate. And, uh, and of course, the weaker inmate's going to give in. Go get your stuff. Here's two, Armijo. Go ahead and take them. You want to go to lockdown? For serious offenses, guards will lock convicts in their cells around the clock. There's no reason or nothing, you know? It's called maximum lockdown. Go ahead, Quintana. They are sent here to the prison's north facility. Located near the main building, this state-of-the-art maximum security prison was constructed after the riot to make sure inmates could never again take over the entire institution. Maximum security unit for the state of New Mexico Corrections Department is primarily to house those inmates designated as the most dangerous in the state. You get the worst of the prison society in here. Uh, you're dealing with the, the most violent, the most dangerous. Okay, we'll get the message to him. Lieutenant Richard right. Lopez has worked at the North for over two years. This needs to go to Ogin. 
the inmates in here because they're locked down 23 hours a day. Uh, their stress levels tend to be much more so than the general population inmate. The officers always must be alert. They walk around for eight hours, always on guard for assaults. Uh, they're being continually verbal harassed by the inmates. One of the favorite tricks of the inmates is to throw urine or feces on the officer as he passes by their cell doors. Or if they manage to get their hands on a detergent of some sort, they will urinate inside a container of the detergent which forms an acid and they'll try to hit the officers in the eyes and the face as they go by. The administration is faced with the situation that uh, we either lock up the predators, which are causing the problems and causing the, the jeopardy to the other inmates, or we lock up their victims in protective custody. Also at the North facility is this new protective custody unit built for suspected informants, sex offenders, and weak inmates who can't survive in the general population. Peter Laycock, an armed robber, was seen talking to investigators after the riot. Convicts labeled him a snitch. He was forced to seek protection here in the PC unit. When the riot broke out, Peter tried to save his cousin in cell block four, the old PC unit. Peter narrowly escaped. It was... Hmm. It was awful. Brutal ain't the word for it, though, no. There's gotta be some kind of a word. I mean, how can you define a massacre? I mean, heads getting chopped off, legs getting chopped off, arms getting chopped off, people getting burnt. You know, I mean... Four was the last place gotten to. When they went in to four, they went in to kill. They had a list. The death squad was in there. And they were just killing people. You owed one of them people on the death squad a candy bar, you were dead. Because all they had to say was, there's a snitch. And he, the person that called him a snitch would make the first, the initial contact with the shank or pipe or whatever, and the rest would join in. Back then, I was scared. I was paranoid. I was... Hell, I knew it was sometime or another. It was, was going to be my turn. Although Peter denies he is a snitch, he says the gangs have a contract on his life. He has already survived three attempts to kill him. Since 1980, there have been 10 riot-related murders at the prison. The latest, Moises Sandoval, asked to be released from PC. Three hours later, he was bludgeoned to death. And all the time that I've done, this is, this is, this is the worst. Living in fear every day. And, you know, waking up in the morning. Yeah, okay, is it my turn? You know, who do I have to watch out for? Did to put poison in my food? You know, are they gonna hit me again? It's just a common day, everyday occurrence, everything, every, every day, you know. I mean, when I walk across the yard, do I have to watch behind my back? You know, who's gonna be the one to come up to me? It's something that I live with every day, you know, when I go to sleep at night, you know, who's gonna come in when I'm asleep? And I'll, I'll have uh, little fights with myself, okay? Uh, arguments with myself. Go to sleep, Peter, because if you're asleep, if they come in, you ain't gonna feel it. Fear is my prison right now whether I'm going to live to see the next day. And he will be protected by a warden who can do whatever is necessary to protect him, a message that needs to be communicated in order to give the reasonable inmate the confidence that he does not have to submit himself to that duress of major convict leaders. Even after eight years, Santa Fe's convict leaders still use the memory of the mass murders to keep their power.
there was the guy that uh, had his head cut off. Then there was a guy that had a, that had a piece of uh, angle iron drove through his head while, and they figured that this guy was alive while this was happening. He was just uh, caught in a cell and held and took a blunt piece of steel and rammed it through his head all the way through. What's that thing Investigators believe Tupac may have been involved in several murders during the riot. The district attorney targeted him for three torture murders. They finally narrowed it down and charged me with the killing of uh, Paul in the Paul, the guy that got his head cut off, and a guy named Briones that got the the steel ran through his head. I'm officially charged with those. Eventually, they dropped all the riot charges against Tupac for lack of evidence. And today, authorities believe he is the leader of the white gang. The most action is in the areas of, uh, of uh, breaking the rules, you know, with the drugs, the gambling, the, the extortion, the prostitution, the, you know, I mean, fuck. Uh, all the people that I know, all the heavyweights, that I've met over the last 20 years, uh, you know, that's the way they make their living, you know. I don't, but, you know, I associate with all these people. I know them, and I like them. A gang and a warden are constantly at battle over who is running the prison. And if the warden cannot effectively deal with the gang, then the gang will run the prison because they're here 24 hours a day intermingling and controlling the, the lives of the other inmates. The leader of the inmate groups should be the warden. Prison administrators claim the balance of power has shifted in Santa Fe, and it is increasingly difficult for them to compete with convict leaders like Tupac. I would lock him up in maximum security, not because he's done anything, but because it would be a clear message to the inmate population, Tupac's no longer a major influence in the operation of this prison. The warden's running the place. To control the gangs, Warden Sullivan locked up several other suspected gang leaders at the North facility. While under investigation, the North convicts are locked down 23 hours a day, with only one hour a day yard time. Inmates are never allowed in the same space. Some have been here for three years. Fernie Ogas, a suspected leader of a Chicano gang, is under investigation for allegedly ordering an inmate murder. Are there organizations that exist inside prison? I have no comment on that. What are some of the names that are being thrown out today that say, you know, before it was a Mexican mafia, what do they say? Well, I'm not going to comment on that either. I'm not, no. We know well in advance the actors in the gang. We know of their behaviors. We believe strongly that we must control those predatory people, which means, of course, locking them in maximum security or administrative segregation separate from the general population. But lockdown based on suspicion is controversial. It's in direct violation of the federal court order implemented after the 1980 riot. That order, called the Duran Consent Decree, sets guidelines for inmate rights, including disciplinary procedures. To lock down a prisoner, the decree says the warden must first prove the suspected convict has been overtly involved in major misconduct. Gang leaders do not overtly involve themselves in major misconduct. They're puppeteers. They're behind the scenes. Prove it to us. Bring it out on paper. Tell us who they are. Tell me who they are. The warden knows it. The administrators know it. Security knows it. We don't know it. You know, we're not out here to promote this and that, you know, but that is the excuse they use to keep us locked down. They say they're gang leaders. They're not gang leaders. There's no, no such thing as gang leaders in this penitentiary. I've been to penitentiaries where uh, I've met gang leaders, so I know what it's about. This doesn't have them. You know, this, is, this has been all an administrative move 
to get people that they feel are fighting them. I'm adamant, absolutely adamant. And if I had to go to federal jail to maintain my position that the inmates in maximum security must be retained in maximum security, I'm so professionally adamant and demanding of that condition that if it came down to it, they would have to incarcerate me. I would not release them. For some reason, all of these old-time prison administrators think the rights that are granted you by the Constitution of the United States are privileges, and they are not privileges. They are rights. They said it was gang-related, and they were selling drugs, and that, uh, extortion. Riley Johnson, serving a life sentence for murder, is a monitor for the consent decree. He collects information for the federal court and keeps a close watch on Warden Sullivan. What we hope to accomplish with the consent decree is that it becomes systemic that they do things the way the consent decree says to do it, and as yet they don't. The consent decree is just good prison management. Uh, the American Correctional Association agrees almost word for word with the consent decree. Uh, what the prison administrators here want is they want that almost unlimited discretionary power back that they had in the 1970s, and it's not ever going to happen. We had to put this here to keep from doing what you almost did. I think so this caught your eye. We have gone through a pendulum swing in my career where inmate rights and inmates entitlements within the prison environment has swung so far that prison wardens and prison administrations uh, reel, their, their heads swim. And, uh, then they don't know how to deal with all of these new rules of the road established for us by the courts and by attorneys. Okay, he'll take care of you. Take Warden care. Sullivan embraced those standards and embraced this decree when he got here. So I don't really know what he's talking about when he says inmates have too many rights. The American Civil Liberties Union assigned attorneys Ray Tuig and Mark Donatelli to oversee the prison's compliance with the consent decree. Both lawyers have defended inmates at Santa Fe since the 70s and saw firsthand the conditions before the riot. The overcrowding, the bad food, and the abusive discipline of inmates. They became committed to bringing change to the penitentiary. Because of that history, the ability of administrators to run their institutions uh, will be regulated, not only by the consent decree, but by the legislators as well. And people who sit in Warden Sullivan's chair are going to have to answer to a number of people because of the, the riot and the uh, brutality suffered by inmates over the past two decades. The history of this prison was such that it, I'm convinced that my predecessors uh, abused discretionary authority. And so the inmates' attorneys and the decree itself trying to compensate for earlier abuses has taken away the discretionary authority, which is essential. This decree was designed to assure that the inmates had certain rights and that those rights were protected. Uh, the give and take of that kind of a process is normal these days. There are 35 states that have decrees uh, of different, differing natures. Here in New Mexico, it's really a, a power struggle who has the power to run the prison. The inmate gangs and the predatory leadership of the inmate population with their attorneys and their consent decree or the warden. This is not a safe prison. And the only way this prison can be made safe is to stop predatory behavior. And in order to do that, the warden has got to have the authority to move decisively and swiftly. And that's an authority, a discretionary authority, that I do not have under the consent decree. Until the warden can win that battle, we've got a problem. On July 4th, 1987, seven of New Mexico's most dangerous prisoners escaped from the penitentiary. The escapees' crimes ranged from armed robbery to multiple murders. All seven convicts escaped from the Super Maximum Security North facility. New Mexico's governor issued a shoot-to-kill order. 
As the search widened, security at the prison and Warden Sullivan's performance came under fire. We'll continue this search as the governor is, in, is ordered. Uh, the pursuit of these men will continue to be very, very vigorous until they're located and identified. After a month-long nationwide search, all the escapees were finally captured. The escape, combined with his controversial lockdown of gang leaders, increased the pressure on Warden Sullivan. We are still uh, faced with an unsafe prison. The inmates still live in an unsafe environment, despite the warden being left alone to run the prison as he chose fit. We have filed a contempt motion against Warden Sullivan because of his violations of the court order, his alleged continued violations of the court order throughout his time as the warden. And those violations, we contended, certainly undermine his effectiveness as a warden because he's failed to take the steps the court order allows him to take and requires him to take to manage a good institution. They didn't say when the list would be published or anything? No, they just said... The warden now faced criminal contempt charges. His alleged violations of the consent decree included locking down suspected gang leaders at the North facility, failing to staff that prison with enough well-trained guards, as well as failing to make regular inspections of the North. The inmate attorneys claimed these actions caused the security breakdown that allowed the July 4th escape to happen. If found guilty, Warden Sullivan faced a fine of $10,000 a day. The inmates immediately conclude We've got the warden down, we got our foot on his throat, and he's on count nine. So we are really showing this dude who's got the power. At the same time, the staff reel in terms of, oh my God, the warden is in trouble. It took me 32 months to finally come to the conclusion the warden cannot win that fight. If a prison is not safe for inmates to live within and for staff to work within, all else that may exist in the prison is for naught. It's not very helpful to give a nutritional balanced diet to a man who's going to be stabbed and have his head bludgeoned tonight and die. The fact that he may die with a balanced nutritional diet in his stomach uh, is not impressive to me. And so I've got to guarantee safety for the inmate population and for the people who work here. If I can't do that for reasons beyond my control, then I choose not to further participate in that process. I remove myself by resignation. Thank you very much for all the good work and help. I wish you weren't going. I wish I wasn't too. But, uh, I'm leaving in good hands. We had good people. George Sullivan left Santa Fe in September. He lasted two and a half years. He was the fourth warden to leave since the riot. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, because... It's just really bad that he's leaving. He's one of the few that has really uh, had enough guts and, and uh, you know, stood by his word about getting rid of the, the gangs within the institution. We all lost uh, a battle, I guess you could say, because uh, everybody's so afraid of that consent decree. I've lasted longer than probably more wardens than I can count on one hand, and uh, for the way that I live in here, uh, it doesn't really make a difference to me one way or the other. That's just a, a space to be filled, and, and uh, I ain't got time to, you know, worry about what the fuck they do. We might as well give the keys to the inmates. They're running it anyway. They're running it right now. We left Santa Fe in the fall, but the struggle there continues under a new warden. 
In November, Captain Marcella Armijo resigned after a dispute with the prison administration. But she has now filed a complaint asking for her old job back. In December, William Jack Tupac Stevens was injured in a gang fight. He was treated and then locked down in the North facility. In January, four convicts took a guard hostage. The new warden sent in a SWAT team, which opened fire. One prisoner was wounded, but the injured guard was rescued. And Warden Sullivan has changed his mind about retirement. He says he's now looking for something challenging and exciting in corrections. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. Next week on Frontline, a father's agonizing decision to withdraw life support from his child. There have been times that I've thought, how can you murder your own child? Nancy Cruzan's family wants to disconnect the tube that pumps food and water into her stomach. A personal tragedy with profound implications. Watch Let My Daughter Die on Frontline. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Frontline was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Educational organizations may inquire about video cassettes by calling 1-800-424-7963.